said you were a win away from Omaha as a player and a coach three separate times. Yeah, you want me to go through them? Please. Let, let's just lean without, into the pain. Without too much pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just no, it's good. Come on. Plenty of therapy behind me. We're all good. We can talk about this now. Welcome back to another episode of Champion School. Uh, today, it's just me. You know, the boys, Austin Byler is down in San Diego. He is working on a, uh, or joining up with uh, ABCA, doing one of the barnstormers down at San Diego State, which is pretty cool, uh, getting to speak at that. And I, I believe we're going to be actually on the youth stage this year. So uh, pretty fired up for that. And then uh, Jay Perk is actually out running a half marathon or a marathon today. Uh, much better runner than I am, but um, they're out dominating life. So I'm out here and we're going to jump right into an episode, uh, a solo episode. But uh, today's guest, super big guest, biggest one we've had for sure. Uh, one of my favorite analysts on all of ESPN, Mike Rooney. He's a college baseball analyst, uh, former baseball coach at ASU, and um, just a great speaker. He has a lot of great insight and some really cool stories. So we'll dive into that shortly. But for now, let's get into the good news of the week. Good news of the week. This week is uh, it's some interesting news, kind of hits a little bit at home. Uh, very recently, I went to Yosemite National Park. My brother got engaged, as mentioned before. Uh, the place was beautiful, uh, insane. Uh, the reason we kind of got on Yosemite initially, it was my wife and I had started rock climbing and um, we watched the movie Free Solo, like a lot of people had, and uh, El Capitan, which is one of the biggest sheer cliffs in, uh, in the world, uh, is located in Yosemite Valley. It's, it's beautiful, but crazy scary to even think about climbing up. Free Solo is about uh, a man, Alex Honnold, who climbed this without a rope. Uh, and pretty much went up the whole thing in like three hours, which is ridiculous. But anyways, this week, uh, or just a couple of days ago, uh, Alex Honnold's mom, who is 70 years old, became the oldest living person or oldest person ever to actually climb, uh, El Cap, which is maddening to me. I mean, seriously, we were over at it. It's, it's a mile high. So you're standing next to it. You're getting close to it. Your palms are just sweating being there. So, um, just a quick word to the wise that when you feel like, you know, you might be too old to, to knock anything out or, or start something new. I mean, this woman started climbing at 59. Um, you have plenty of time to accomplish some really cool things in your life. And, uh, there's no reason to shut anything down just because you're approaching 59 or 60. So, um, amazing story. Uh, if you can check it out, uh, and really look into El Cap because just seeing it in person is insane to me. So, uh, really cool. Uh, good news of the week. Uh, for now, let's move on to this week's end. This week's Zen, uh, QB Meyer has been putting out some really cool quotes for Major League University uh, every day or every other day, at least uh, some random quote pops up and, and we get to read it. And he's done a great job uh, putting some pictures with it and making some cool graphics. But anyways, today's one, the quote is the separation between stimulus and response is the choice. Um, I think this thing is really key, basically saying that uh, how you act and how you respond and, and your emotions and, and whatnot are all um, your choice. You get to, you get to choose, even when it feels like, ugh, like this is, makes me so mad, so angry. Uh, it's just snap decisions. Reality is you get to choose, right? So let's go baseball terms. You strike out three times in a game. Uh, and then, you know, we're walking off the field after we'll say even after a win, right? Some guys easily, can just stare at that over three, three punchies, three big situations, and just wear that all day. Um, they have a bad mood because of it. They bring other people down, even after a win. I mean, sometimes you can see just dudes just hanging their heads. And um, you, you got to understand that you you can choose, hey, 
to look at the over three, or I can look right at uh, the team's win, you know, shift the mindset. First of all, you got to be a team guy anyways. A win is a win. Uh, it shouldn't matter what you did that day other than the fact that the team won. But uh, number two, you know, even if you guys lost, you know, we can look at it as a learning experience of, hey, these guys aren't going to get me out again with those pitches. There's no way. Uh, or, hey, these are some things I can tweak and work on moving forward. Um, but really, you got to find ways to grow that gap, that separation. Uh, meditation has been one thing that's really helped me um, settle into the moment and not really let it all get me too worked up. It can be difficult, no doubt. Uh, I was a guy that was quick to trigger every once in a while, especially in high school. Just little things would set me off and I wouldn't know how to slow it down and and recover right it was it was not me responding it was me just snapping so uh over time and and obviously age helps with that but you come to realize that hey these little things it's not that big a deal right like we can all move past it the only thing that matters is right now this moment and um you know how do you handle that how do you bounce back that's much more important than what's ever happened to you in your life. So a uh, quick little tidbit for today's weekly Zen. I thought that was a really cool, great quote from QB. Um, and it really pertains to everything that we talk about here at major league university. So anyways, moving on coach, Mike Rooney, the, the meat of this entire episode, the guy's a legend and you'll see it when we get into this interview, uh, Jay perk actually worked for him at ASU. And then, uh, he reached out to him and got him on the guy jumped right in and said, yes. And, and I mean, he has a million things going on uh, as you'll hear in this podcast, but he took the time out to speak with us um, because at the end of the day, he just loves growing the game. So uh, we can't thank Mike enough, but uh, for now, let's just go ahead and jump into the interview. Uh, we're back. Uh, Coach Mike Rooney joining us, uh, ESPN analyst, the man, uh, my favorite analyst. We'll, we'll dive into all that. But uh, obviously, we're joined by Jay Perk. No BZB Austin Byler tonight. He is with some family things. So uh, we're just going to kick it off right into it. Uh, Mike, how are you? What's up, guys? Yeah, this is great. I, I you, know, you guys are awesome, but disappointed to not cross horns with, uh, with Coach Byler. So, but this is great. This is awesome. Yeah, looking forward to our chat. Yeah, absolutely. I guess to get started, uh, for the people that don't know you, uh, give us a little background and how did you, how are you where you're at right now? Goodness gracious. That is, <laughs> you, I should have stretched before. This. I know, right? <laughs> um, so, so, okay. I'll give you guys super high level bullet points. Grew up in suburban Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, went to Notre Dame for college, Irish Catholic, oldest son. I was going to Notre Dame. My dad went there. Like that was the dream to go there just so happens that Pat Murphy was in his second year as the head coach at Notre Dame. When I got there, um, he was 29 years old. I tried to walk on to the team. I didn't even, I, had, I thought I had literally 0% chance of making it made it by some miracle played for four years. Craig councils, my teammate for four years, you know, we know what's become of Murph's career. And then, um, you know, so it was incredible. And then I, I went back to Philly. I was a high school coach at Malvern prep. I had two first round picks. I'm 25 and 28 years old. I have no idea what, what I'm doing, but you know, it's just like, sometimes you're blessed. Right. And my first, I'm 24 years old. Um, and, uh, Ben Davis is our catcher second pick in the draft. And so, um, I, I then ended up going to Arizona state with, with coach Murphy, with Pat Murphy to be his volunteer, assistant coach. I ended up being there for six years, that first run, then became the head coach at, at Phoenix College, a junior college, ended up starting to dabble in broadcasting at that point. And, you know, Murph was instrumental in helping me get my foot in the door at ESPN. And I, I got to do my first game for ESPN in 2009. And um, yeah, it's like hard to believe this 13 years ago. And, and um, now I, I, you know, I have a full-time real job. That's great. But I, I, I write, and contribute for D1 Baseball, which is awesome. Love working with Kendall and Aaron Fit, and then um, the ESPN stuff. So yeah, I that probably went a little bit longer than I wanted it to, but that's that's how we got here to 2021. Who knew? I wouldn't say it was. I mean, you have a long resume. You've hit so many great stops, but you've been surrounded by so many great people. You know, so good dive into Coach Murphy a little bit. 
Uh, he's historic in the game of college baseball, but talk to us about coach Murphy and what it was like working underneath him. Yeah, I would say, I mean, my wife and I owe a lot to Pat Murphy, you know, it's, um, you know, gosh, I met, I got to play for him when he was 29 years old and, you know, that was in the late eighties. And so it, you know, Murph is definitely in that old school coach, you know, he is, he has progressed a ton. I think we all have, but uh, you know, Murph's the person that when I just had lunch with him the other day and, and he's the guy that says, Hey, if you're a coach, you know, get you, you better be good with being a work in progress. Cause that's what we all are. But my point with Murph is when we played for him and when, when I coached for him, he was very challenging. You know, Jay Perk knows this, like Murph is set a really high standard and was just not interested in any conversations whatsoever as to why that standard could not be achieved or met. So, so it was challenging, you know, Murph w- w- really believed in direct feedback, you know, like you were going to always know where you stood, but I will tell you guys this, the, 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 the way I summarize my experience with Pat Murphy is that the things in my life that have been achieved that I'm most proud of, um, Murph's fingerprints are all over them. You know, he's kind of one of those guys that helps you see things bigger for yourself than you can see him. I would also tell you that when I, you know, you're done playing for him and I'm done coaching for him. Murph is not a guy that's hoping to help you out. He demands that he gets to help you out. When I'm applying for the, the, the coaching job at Phoenix college, Murph is stalking the athletic director at Phoenix college to give me an interview. You know, my, I, I'm, you know, my wife has a health challenge. My wife has MS and um, you know, it's, it's, she's amazing. Uh, it's, it's a part of our life and Murph, outside of our families has been the single most um, helpful person in that area, you know, again, goes out, has gone out of his way to be helpful to us in that area of our life. So, you know, again, was, was playing and coaching for Murph a picnic at all times? No, it absolutely was not. But again, if, if you're in it to see how good you can be, if you're in it to see, um, you know, if you're in it for the achievement it's, it's amazing. And the relationships that, that we all have from having had those experiences are priceless. So yeah, I, I, you guys can tell, I, I think, you know, Murph is like family to Jenny and I, and, um, and uh, just, you know, again, it's been a blessing in our life for sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's awesome to hear. And so I kind of want to build off of that a little bit because you talked about Murph's kind of coaching philosophy. Did you take a lot of what you learned from him into your coaching philosophy or did you make some, did you adapt or do things that you were kind of like, ah, this is not the route I want to take, but how did you kind of like come up with your coaching philosophy as you made your way through yeah. the, the coaching world? Yeah, it's a great question. This is kind of funny. So, you know, in my twenties, you know, I, I leave Malvern Prep and I become an assistant Arizona State. My dream was to be a Division One head baseball coach. And the way my vision for it was, hey, Murph is Bobby Knight and I'm going to be Mike Krzyzewski, right? I'm going to be <laughs> Coach yeah. K. Like Murph is insane. I'm going to be a sane version of all of his greatness. And so, you know, I say that kiddingly, but, you know, like not all, not all kiddingly, Murph was a real lightning rod when we played in coach form, a very controversial. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, to your point, Jared, like I, there was so much about playing and coaching for Murph that I loved. I love the standard that he held our team to. I love that as a player, you felt like you were winning when you took the field because of Murph's presence. You know, I, I I love that. I I love like you're an assistant coach and I'll never forget one of our academic advisors at Arizona state. I was in a conversation with, and he's like, Hey, you guys don't understand. Like, even though the athletic directors get a little worn out by Murph at times, cause he's so demanding the support staff in this building, baseball is their favorite sport because you never have to worry about a baseball player at Arizona state. They're so scared of Murph and disappointing <laughs> yeah. Murph and get in trouble with Murph. Like the, you guys have by far the best team to work with. So, you know, that part, I really, I, I really, yeah, that was part of my philosophy. You know, Murph was never a guy that had a bunch of rules. His, he had, he basically said, I got one rule. Don't misrepresent the program, period. You know, and, and, and so, uh, yeah, like, like I would say there's a lot of Murph in me. My dad is similar to that. We were, my, my brother and sister and I were kind of raised that way. But, you know, I, I also, we, I think we all learn in coaching. You do have to do it in your own way you know, the worst thing you can do is try to be the next Pat Murphy or the next Mike Krzyzewski. You got to, you know, you can take lessons and principles from those people, but you got to be authentic to yourself because otherwise the players will sniff you out in two seconds. Right away. 
they spell it from a mile, you oh, know? Yeah. yeah. So being authentic for sure. Would, um, with that, you coached at ASU and you guys had so many great players rolling through them, through that program. Can you just dive into a couple of the players that, I mean, they, there's dudes that I looked up to that were playing there for a long time. So just dive into yeah. some of the players you got to coach. Yeah. And I'll tell you guys that there, there's, I'm going to give you a name before I give you some players that gets lost in all this. So Murph was obviously amazing. Arizona state recruits itself in some ways. Um, you know, Murph is a great closer in recruiting. Our recruiting coordinator when I was there is a guy named Jay Safara, who's retired now, who was just unbelievable. I mean, our recruiting classes were always top five, top 10 nationally. And Jay is the guy that was just kind of behind the curtain incredible relationship builder. Um, he was so good. So I was really blessed and on both sides, like, you know, get a head coach to coach for like Murph and you've got a teammate like Jay Safara, who's just, he was so dynamic in recruiting. Um, he, he was so good in a million different ways, but you know, that the headliners were my first year. Um, Willie Bloomquist is our <laughs> shortstop, mm -hmm. right? Um, 16 year big leaguer. And then, you know, we get to coach Dustin Pedroia for three years. We got to coach Andre Ethier. Hey, we got to coach Ian Kinsler only for one semester. And then he transferred <laughs> to Missouri. And I, I would say that was mostly our fault. And, and when I say our, I mean, the infield coach is on this call tonight. So, you know, it's like I'm putting the figure squarely at myself on that one. But, you know, it, those are some headliners. You know, I think what was cool is they all had different paths. You know, Willie was kind of a football guy from Washington, the state of Washington. Dustin was, you know, so unique in a million ways, a Sacramento kid, just the best mental game you've ever seen in your life. Unflappable confidence. You know, Andre Ethier is an incredible story where, I mean, this is a kid that, I don't know, he's made $140 million in the big leagues who we sent to junior college after his first semester. And you guys have been around it long enough to know that most kids, when you do that, they they're never coming back and it's going to they're going to tell their grandkids how, you know, that coaching staff screwed me over. But Andre was the kid who took full responsibility for why that happened, went and was a junior college All-American, came back to us, was an All-American for Arizona State. And um, yeah, I mean, like not everybody comes as a finished product like a Dustin Pedroia. Those are actually the exceptions. And and so, you know, those are some of the names I could I could keep you guys here all night you know, really proud of my, my time at Arizona state and, and uh, just a bunch of great people and, and obviously exceptional players. Yeah. And I kind of want to build out that because you talked about kind of the, the mental side of the game and that's what a lot of what we focus on at major league university, were there things that you saw players who had that kind of strong mental side of the game, kind of tools that they implemented um, in order to kind of uh, get themselves prepared every single day? Yeah, I would say, um, it was interesting because I, I think of the mental side of baseball almost like a like a tool. Some kids, you know, Dustin Bedroya was so naturally confident. I think his parents deserve a lot of credit for that. But, you know, he had a gift in that area. Other kids like Andre's one I would think of had to really work at it like, hey, I react to failure in the game in this way. And if I want to go, if I want to get to my goals, I have to adjust how I respond. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, Murph was on the forefront of the mental game in that, you know, like Ken Revisa and Cal State Fullerton and Augie Greedo and George Horton and those guys. I mean, they were like beyond pioneers, right? Like they were Columbus, for God's sakes. <laughs> yeah. But we were not that far behind. I mean, Harvey, the late Harvey Dorfman, who was amazing, he would come and be with our team twice a year. You know, we would read Harvey's books um, with our team. Uh, it, it was, you know, Murph. Um, when he was trying to take his game as the head coach at Arizona State to the next level, he was uh, seeing a sports psychologist personally to, to really, you know, get, get his uh, game to the next level. So um, I, I think it is, I think some kids are more gifted at it than others, but I do think that there are great tools out there. And first is recognizing that, hey, it is a muscle, confidence is a muscle, and I can I can build strength in that area, but I have to, I have to have resources. I have to have routines. I have to, um, I have to be willing to work at it. And you guys know, working at the mental game is not sexy. You know, it's, it's so easy to just skip those things. Um, and I don't think the coach can be the only one in charge of it, right? Like, I don't think, 
I, I know a lot of great coaches now will do, I think about Jeremy Sheetner that, you know, at, at Georgia Gwinnett, that they do 15 minutes of it, to maybe longer to start the day. I actually don't think that's enough. I think the players have to take a lot of individual accountability if it's going to be done the right way. But, you know, it's a separator. It really is. I mean, there's, there's no truer statement in baseball than confidence is king. You show me a player with confidence and, and you got a, you got a shot. It, now let's dive into your, your broadcast side of it. Like for me, this, this makes me more nervous than getting on a ball field sometimes, you know, like just <laughs> sitting and having this conversation, but like for you, did that always come naturally? Like speaking into a, like talking to a camera, talking to people, or is that something that you had to grow over time as well? Well, I'd say, Ray, the talking part, very natural. The camera part, not my favorite <laughs> yeah. part, right? Like, like, no, not at as all. As my dad likes to point out, the face for radio. But uh, all kidding aside, you know, I, I, you know, that is true, actually. I was saying it jokingly, but there's a lot of truth in that. You know, the talking, I was raised on sports radio growing up in suburban Philly. I mean, like, we listen to sports radio, not music. And so... Uh, you know, like talking about sports, the give and take the, you know, that stuff. I love it. And, and on top of it, I only broadcast college baseball, which, you know, my mate, my number one qualification to talk about college baseball is that I'm a super fan, right? Like I really genuinely love the sport. Um, I'm not totally sure how we got to that point, but I do. It's just, it's something that's hardwired in me. I love, you know, college baseball, I wake up in the morning and I check my college baseball Twitter feed list. You know, I go to bed doing the same thing. It's, you know, it's, it's my favorite thing um, as far as my life and my hobbies go. So the talking about it, I love, you know, like I love, I love talking about college baseball. I love sharing college baseball with sports fans, like helping them or trying to get them to see what, why I think it's so great. But I would tell you, Ray, that the, um, you know, the, the stuff about being on camera and that type of stuff. I, I, I don't know that I wouldn't consider myself a natural at that. I don't know that I ever will be. I don't think I'm like abysmal or anything like that, but what I want to do is I want to, I want to talk ball. Like I want to, I want to, you know, not that everything has to happen in a bar, but I like, that's, that's to me the, the deal, right? Like you're, you're sitting at a bar with your buddies um, may or may not be having an adult beverage. Who cares about that part? And you're just, you're just cutting it up, right? Like you're chopping it up. That's the part that I love. And if there happen to be cameras there, that's great too. Cause that helps grow the sport, but you know, it's, it's all good either way to me. Yeah. And I think that's something I, I, cause I've listened, I've heard that notion come from a lot of different announcers. I think Dallas Braden has talked about it. He's like, the reason he feels like he can be so good at his job and talk about it is because he loves the game. And I think that's a, a thing that can be missing sometimes for a lot of people. Um, can you kind of dive into the experience of covering the college world series? Do you have like a favorite experience from the CWS? I think it's probably Ray and I were kind of talking about it pre-interview. Like it's something that everybody should probably just experience once in a lifetime. Um, and can you kind of get, dive into what it's like to be able to, to cover that? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just awesome in every single way, you know, like yeah. it's, um, your, your whole life in college baseball, it's like you go to bed thinking about it. You wake up thinking about it. Um, I was one win away from Omaha three different times as a player and a coach. And so it's funny. The first time I quit coaching um, after the 04 season at ASU, my wife and I, because, you know, like your spouse, it's the same thing. Like, you you know, you're living and dying with every win. So Jenny and I actually went to Omaha for the first time after the 04 season, after I, I left the ASU the first time, because we were just like, hey, this place has kind of tortured us for our whole adult life. Like, we should just go and see if it's worth it. And we had an awesome trip. And of course, I was right back into coaching like a year and a half later. But <laughs> yeah. the um, so so I will tell you guys, I've I've now gone, I think, seven times as either doing radio or TV and every time when when you know you look at your boarding pass on your phone and you see Omaha like it 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 it, it you just kind of freak out like in a positive way and you know the what the background on my phone is is the um the view from the dugout in Rosenblatt the third base dugout not Rosenblatt I'm sorry uh, TD Ameritrade uh, because you know, like that, I wanted to be the dugout reporter. And so I wanted to put that image in my brain. So it's, it's everything you think it's amazing. It's, it's the pinnacle, the sport, it's the city of Omaha does an amazing job with it. So 
you know, I never forget the first game I had to do for ESPN as the dugout reporter was Oregon State and um, Oregon State's really, really good team. The team that showed up in Omaha 54 and four in 2017 and they're playing Cal State Fullerton. And it was a really tight game. And it just it was almost like an out of body experience. I mean, it was so just to feel the electricity in the stadium. You know, it's a really big stadium. It's twenty seven thousand people or something like that. So. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I can't give you a more intelligent description <laughs> of what it's like, but it's just, it's just awesome in every way. Was, was that the dropped Arkansas foul ball year? That was the next year. So, so remember 2017 was Oregon state's ridiculous team. And they literally showed up in Omaha with a 54 and four <laughs> record. I mean, think about how, how crazy, crazy is that? that is playing in a power five conference like the Pac-12, playing nothing but division one teams. They were 54 and four. And then um, they ended up their final record was 56 and six because they they had that crazy loss to LSU in Omaha. The next year, they weren't quite as good. But the next year in 2018 is when is what you're describing, Ray, where they beat Arkansas on the drop fly ball. Devastating. Absolutely How about that or Oregon State team, by the way, guys? Four first round picks in your lineup. Four. Hell, Crazy. was that Adley's last year? So 18, 17 was his freshman year. 18 was his sophomore year. But the, the remember, he his so he's the first pick in the whole draft in 28 in 2019. In 2018, remember, Grenier, the shortstop, was a first round pick. Madrigal was their second baseman, and Trevor Larnick, their right fielder, also a first round pick. So it was it was almost not fair. And Wanna, Nate Yeski's their pitching coach and yeah. Pat Casey's their head coach and Pat Bailey's the other assistant. I mean, it was yeah, they're crazy good. It's an all star staff. Larnick is one of my favorite pro baseball players right now. Just even total. watching him in college was ridiculous. Monster, so, total monster. Great grew. Um taught, let's rewind just a little bit. For your you said you were a win away from Omaha as a player and a coach three separate times. Yeah, you want me to go through them? Please. Let, let's just lean without, into the pain. Without too much pain. <laughs> <laughs> just no, it's good. Come on. Plenty of therapy behind me. We're all good. We can talk about this now. So you know, it, it is really, you know, in the moment, it's devastating sort of, but it's, it's really cool. So my senior year at Notre Dame, we make the NCAA tournament. And, um, you know, I told you guys, Craig Council was our best player. He was my, you know, my classmate at Notre Dame. And so he's our shortstop. So we go to Miami's regional. It's Ron Frazier's last year. Charles Johnson's their catcher. I mean, they were really good. They're the host, obviously. So we lose our first game to North Carolina. No, no, no. To South Carolina. And we come all the way through the loser's bracket. These were the six team regionals. By the way, this was so long ago, guys, that Ray Tanner was the head coach at NC State. He hadn't even got to South Carolina yet. So anyway, we lose to South Carolina. We come back through the loser's bracket. We beat Miami. And so now they've got a loss, too. So the regional's kind of gone upside down. So we come all the way through. We're playing Miami. Winner goes to Omaha. We got a loss. They got a loss. And they beat us 5-1. to one. Jeff Alkire had pitched for the Olympic team. He was amazing. Left-hander. And so um, that was win winner, winner goes to Omaha. We lost. They were great. It was but an unbelievable experience. I'll never forget leaving the field. My dad's in the stands. He, you know, I can see him crying. You know, it's just like an amazing moment to share with my dad. Um, and so that's my playing time. That was our senior year. So 2000, um, I'm coaching at Arizona state. We're a top eight national seed. We're, we, we go out in the regional two and O Texas under Augie Garrido. They had not been to Omaha yet under Augie Garrido. They come all the way through the losers bracket and beat us twice in two really tight games. If we had won, so I'm counting this one, this, this is one you could put an asterisk next to. I'm counting this one. If we had just beaten Texas one of those two games, we would have hosted Penn State at ASU to go to Omaha. And their coach, Joe Hindelang, great guy, had had a heart attack during the regional. Oh. So they were going to have to come to Arizona State and play us without, without their head coach. Head coach. So I'm counting that one. Like Texas boat raced them twice. No offense to Penn State, but I'm counting that one. If we just beat Texas one more time, for sure, we're beating Penn State at home without their head coach. The other time was a legitimate 2003. That was the Pedroia, Ethier, Larish, um, Travis Buck, Tuffy Ghost, which we had five big leaguers in our Jeez. lineup. 
and we played Cal State Fullerton, took them. We had to play at their place, game three of the Super Regional. They beat us. Um, but again, that Cal State Fullerton team had seven big leaguers in their lineup. Red Turner, Blake Davis, Kurt Suzuki, um, Jason Windsor, Ricky Romero, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was it was crazy. And they beat us in game three of the Super Regional to go to Omaha. So those are my three. God, devastating. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's... You're, you're thinking about it. In 2003, we're like, we got five big leaguers on the field, and that's not good enough. I mean, what do you got to do around here to get to Omaha? <laughs> yeah. That's that's just crazy to think of, too. And I, I guess I have a question that relates a little bit to going from that college ball to pro level. Um, it's, one thing I noticed when I worked for the Royals is that a lot of the players struggled because a lot of especially the college guys, because when they were coming from that college level to the pros, they were competing as a team in college. And so every single day they were going out there fighting to try to get to the Omaha and try to win the College World Series. When you get to pro ball, it's a completely different ball game um you're on these teams trying to make it to the major leagues did you ever work with players and kind of figure out what were some of the steps that they took in order to help them through that transition into pro ball and kind of figure out um what how to make that adjustment on a daily basis yeah i mean i would say i would tell you guys that i'm very passionate about i think every kid i let me say it this way i like that baseball families can choose professional baseball or college baseball. I like that they have that choice. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm about to talk out of both sides of my mouth. That said, I think 99.9% .9 of kids need to at least go to a year of junior college before they go into professional baseball. So at least you can figure out how to be an adult, live on your own without having to deal with, you know, the rigors of the minor leagues all at the same time, because I'm telling you guys, my belief is that there's nothing harder in professional sports than getting yourself through the minor leagues to the big leagues. It is brutally difficult. I think it's it's underestimated. So I would tell you, Jared, that I think it's a good question. I think what you notice in college baseball is there are some kids that the team lifts them up mm -hmm. and, and helps them play their best. Um, and, and they, you have to help them kind of think more singularly about their own game at times. I think there are other kids that are naturally disconnected and you have to help them connect to the team. And so I think when they get into pro ball, those two kids have to learn those other skills. Like if you're the kid that needs the team to lift you up, you're going to have to get yourself more adjusted to, you're not going to have that feeling again until you're in the big leagues, you know, in the minor leagues, you're going to have to figure out how to maybe disagree with a coach in a very respectful way. Um, you know, you're not going to have the same coach that you had for three years like you do in college. And I think the kids that naturally can kind of, you know, kind of decompartmentalize the team and really get locked in on themselves. I do think those kids have an advantage in minor league baseball. I do think when you get to the big leagues, a lot of the things that, that are important in college resurface, but the minor leagues is no joke. And, 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 and again, there are great instructors um, but that level of baseball, man, like to stay he physically healthy for 140 games, to perform at that level against that level of competition. Um, that's why, again, I think I, I'm so passionate about college because, you know, like you are jumping into shark infested waters. You better be ready to swim and swim fast. College, the whole the whole road from college baseball to the professionals ranks is ridiculous. Like Coach Lon at Arizona is a guy that I always say like, the last time you're really with a team until you make it to the league is college mm -hmm. baseball, you know? So I, I, I don't know. It's tough it, question for you. We're looking at college basketball tournament versus the college world series. What in your mind is tougher to win? Ooh, tougher to win. Mm -hmm. That is a great question. I would say, you know, in college basketball, it's tricky because you have to be perfect, right? Like you have to win six games, no, no, you know, no do overs. Right. So I think that part is, is seems incredibly difficult, but again, I think the baseball deal is really hard too. I mean, you know, if you get in the loser's bracket in the regional round, that's really tricky. Um, I, I would say, I would say they're equally difficult. You know, I, I think baseball can be a more fluky game. So I think that makes it hard on the baseball side. Like, you know, the, the number one from Siena can beat a really good team in the SEC. I, I mean, how often has Siena beaten Arkansas in basketball? I don't know. I will say this, guy though, guys, I, I think the basketball tournament is such an American institution. 
And I would like to see our baseball tournament go a little bit more like that. Like, yeah, I, I'm a proponent of that 32 host idea. I think that would be huge for our tournament. Um, I think it's a fascinating question, though. I, whew, I mean, let's just I'll, here's my final answer. Both are really hard. And if you win those things, that is an, uh, an unreal accomplishment. Hat tip for anybody that even yes, gets there. Honestly, right. the Elite Eight or the College World Series is just a, an amazing feat. Go ahead, JP. Yeah, I guess. So one of the final questions that I have, um, I, I saw a lot of the work that you were doing with D1 Baseball on kind of highlighting the volunteer assistant coaches. Yes. I would, can you touch on that a little bit? Because I think that's something intriguing. I know Ray, Ray's been in a volunteer assistant coach himself and probably <laughs> has tons grinder. of stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I'd love to hear more about that work and kind of how you're working with those coaches to kind of share their stories and the important role that they play on every single team. Yeah, I would say, you know, like, I guess the, the, so, so every Sunday night we're doing those, we're calling them the fourth coach conversations. And basically, I just put it on Twitter once and just said, hey, anybody that wants to participate who's a volunteer coach, just shoot me an email. And I'm doing five coaches a night. I'm booked up all the way through December and we're going to do wow. some in January too. And, and the way, the, the, where it generated from was I just kept catching myself talking about coaching staffs. Like you guys, you guys just caught me. I mentioned Oregon state and I mentioned Pat Casey, Pat Bailey, Nate, yes, Nate Yeske, and didn't even mention Andy Jenkins. I mean, how criminal is that? And I kept catching myself doing that. And I was a volunteer. I was the volunteer at Arizona state for 18 months. And I might still be the volunteer there. If, if John Pulowski didn't get the head coaching job at College of Charleston in the middle of the year. So Murph couldn't really open it up and just promoted me. I, I mean, talk about the luckiest thing in the world. So I just kept getting mad at myself for a not giving these guys their due credit and then B not even knowing who they were. And so selfishly, this idea came to me and I was thinking, you know, this would be a really awesome way for me to get to know these guys without me just surfing 300 websites. Cause I'm a person that gets, I get a lot more out of conversational learning than I do out of just reading and studying. And so I, 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 you know, Aaron fit and Kendall Rogers are awesome. They are, they, they are incredible teammates for me. And so I just, I pitched them on the idea and I said, I, I'm not married to this. You guys tell me if I need to go take a drug test or not. Like, do you think this would be a fun idea or do you think I should scrap it? Because I'm about to, surrender my next 16 Sunday nights. Right. <laughs> so, um, they were like, awesome. You should do it for sure. And so we did it and you know, it, it's five coaches a night. So it's like, I want to give these guys exposure. It's a lot of rapid fire questions. I'm trying to, it's almost like a, a pre job interview in that regard. Like I'm trying to give these guys a chance to get to know them so selfishly that, that I can get to know them, that other people can get to know them. So, um, that's, that's the genesis of genesis of it. It's been a blast. And, and, you know, again, like these guys are the lifeblood of our profession. And so for them to just coach in the shadows, it just, I'm just not good with that anymore. And so that um, it's been fun. It's been a blast. Let me give you a round of applause for that. First of all, because <laughs> as a, as, as a volley, I mean, then it, I did it for seven years of just like, the whole situation is tough. It's a catch 22 for the kids because you can't go out and recruit. And that's what everybody needs for them to hire you for the next round. Yep. If you're a volley and you're good at it, the head guy doesn't really want to let you leave while they still kind of put you on pedestal and say, Hey, hire this guy. But it's just a, it's just a tough situation. So thank you for what you're doing for yep. those guys. Honestly. I have so many funny stories from that time in my life. It's like, um, but, but, you know, like to your point, Ray Mac, like I remember how, you know, like you have some tough conversations with yourself when you're in that position, you know, like, especially like I'll, I'll speak for myself, you know, I'm 30 years old. I've been afforded a Notre Dame college education, wasn't free. And here I am volunteer baseball coaching. I'm tutoring kids in math on Tuesday nights. My mom is sending me $60 a month for groceries. Yeah. I, I repeat, I am a 30 year old college graduate. <laughs> You know, and, 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 you know, and then my dad would give me a hard time and say, well, you know, just so you know, Jesus lived at home until he was 33. So, you yeah. know, you get that. Thanks, dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, this has been great. JP, did you want to rack one more question before we jump into the game or yeah. we, you go for it? Sure. I got one more question. So do you have your best Pat Murphy story? <laughs> <laughs> best Murph story. Best <laughs> Murph story. Boy, that is tricky. There are, there are, um, there's so many good ones. 
so gosh, what is my best Murph story? The um, I I think one of my best Murph stories is gosh, that that is you talk about flooding the engine. So I, I immediately think about like our um, our Notre Dame days when he was, and in fairness, right, he's late twenties, early thirties. Like none of us are, you know, making our best decisions at that point. But so the, I never forget going to the walk on meeting, and. Uh, you know, Murph is a massive dude and he was a golden gloves boxer when he was a kid. And, you know, this is when he's really young and Murph is, he's probably six foot two, 240 pounds. He would lift weights with the Notre Dame football team. Um, you know, when we were, you know, we were there. And so Murph walks in to the, um, Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to reroute to a, a different Notre Dame story. So here, this is, this is my freshman year at Notre Dame, same genre. Okay. So we get, this is late eighties. We get a, a message in our dorm rooms on our answer machines that says, Hey, uh, emergency team meeting nine o'clock. It's like a Wednesday night. I'm a freshman at Notre Dame every day. I'm checking my locker. I am the walk-on of walk-ons, right? Like I, I, there's no way I'm making this team every day is a blessing. So I'm like, Oh crap. So we all scramble back to the athletic. Uh, it's called the Loftus center at Notre Dame. So the meetings at nine Murph was famous for, he would let us sit in that, in, that, in those meeting rooms and just be anxious and he comes in at like 9 20 well we're all just you know sweating to death right and so murph comes in he gets to the podium he looks at us and he says fellas i just spent time on the phone with one of your dads tonight the next time one of your dads calls me about playing time you are no longer part of this program and he walks out <laughs> That's awesome. and i'm telling you guys you can't even hear anybody breathing in the room right now. And everybody's brain is doing the same thing. Everybody's brain is saying, Oh my God. Oh my God. Did my, was it my dad? Was it my dad? Was it my dad? <laughs> right. And then everyone Murph clears and everyone just sprinting back to the dorm to call their dad saying, please tell me it wasn't you. Oh, <laughs> it was, oh, it was, man. but it was, it was so great. I mean, yeah, I, there's a million Murph stories, but, and, and you obviously probably can't even do that in 2021, but I'll tell you, once we got through that moment, it was really cool as a player because you're kind of like, hey, this is the levelest of level playing fields. Like mm -hmm. this dude is not going to tolerate anything that's going to prevent us from winning a game. It was awesome. And that's great. he's flat out telling you, like, it's no one making those decisions but him. Like this is coming from within a guy that's seen you guys practice and go about it day in and day out. Like he's making the right decision for the team to succeed. So yep. really cool, really cool stories. Um, Love it. Are you ready? Let's. You ready for the game? I know Let's we go. didn't really yes. hype you up a whole lot, a lot on this, but uh, the game is called On It or Off It. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go through a list of ten things. They're kind of random, uh, and you're gonna say you're either on it, you're for it, and or you're off it. It's not really what you're about. And then just give us like a one sentence as to why. Okay. On it or off it. Okay. Let's okay. go. You ready? Yeah. Yes. Uh, number one, going skiing. Uh, haven't done it in forever, but on it. Loved skiing as a younger person. Very nice. Uh, number two, Lord of the Rings. Uh, off it. <laughs> yeah, Agreed. never, never, Agreed. never, never got into it. There you go. Uh, who wants to be a millionaire? Uh, off it. Just never been a big game show guy. There you go. All good. Uh, cryptocurrency. Off it. <laughs> I'm kind of like a I'm kind of like a single sitter when it comes to those types of things. So. That just feels like, uh, you know, that, that feels too uh, trying to hit a home run ish to me. Plus, my dad and my brother are, are like stockbrokers and Wall Street guys. I think they would kill me if I got into that. There you go. Uh, here's one uh, your wheelhouse Barry Bonds to the Hall of Fame. On it. No doubt. Slam dunk. Slam dunk. Yeah. I mean, oh guy. Yeah. yeah. Like just best, best player ever. You know, like it's just, you know, it, it, yeah, there's too many contradictions already. You know, I, yeah, on it. Like I was, guy was unbelievable. I mean, just and just uh, even pre steroids, whatever. Like just everything about his game was remarkable. Really, he's one of my favorite players of all time. Just wanted to yeah. make sure. Yeah, stuck. <laughs> uh, electric cars. Oh, okay. The way gas prices are going, I guess I'll yeah. say on it reluctantly. Yeah. I've never, I've never partaken, but it sure seems like we're going down that way. I paid four sixty eight for gas today. About lost. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, poker. Uh, off it. Not just not a risk taker in that area. So like that, like you're talking about playing poker for like money, right? Yeah. Or with the boys either way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all in 
on anything with the fellas, like fantasy football fanatic, that type of stuff. Just card games, never got into. Um, not really like a sports gambler or a card gambler, but like anything with the fellas golf trip, fantasy football. If Jenny is allowing it, I am in like Flynn and I will get there early. <laughs> make sure you ask because that's the what we got to do. Um, that's right. Playing, playing golf is, was one that was listed. Let's go. What's your favorite course to go to? You're a golfer, it sounds like. Yeah. So so I love golf, but because life is so busy now, it's hard to get to. So my answer is I will play anywhere, anytime. Um, so um, I, if you made me pick a course right now, I would say Paiute is up in my, our fantasy football draft for the Notre Dame guys. My, my Notre Dame classmates or roommates are, is up in Vegas. And um, we, there's a course Paiute up there that's really fun. But really, I'm picking that because I only get to play three or four rounds a year. And that's one of them. And it's like one of the things I look forward to the most. It's amazing. You get you guys all get together, all the Notre Dame guys, and go to Vegas every year. Yeah, like, and it's it's amazing. Like, there's very little um, guys missing it. Our the commissioner of our league, he wrestled at Notre Dame, and he's engaged now, but he had never gotten married, so he just does. He's not allowed people to miss it, and so it's it's it's, it's the best. It's it's oh, it's so awesome. That's awesome. Uh, the UFC. Off it, but just because of ignorance, I think I would really like it if I got into it. But I just have run out of, um, you know, uh, what's what's the bandwidth for adding sports. I think I would like it, but I just I've never I've never indulged. Okay, last one. Uh, I'm a I'm a big Giants guy, and there's just rumors floating. Marco Stroman to the Giants. I would I would like it for the Giants. I like Marcus Stroman. Yeah, on it. Yeah, God, I, would, I, would, I would. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I like I like it. I like the way he he operates. I'm in. Did you hear that, JP? That's the first Mike Rooney announced Stroman to the Giants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, Sneak, sneakily hoping you would say the Royals, but yeah, yeah but that's where I'm wanting to go. Oh, there you no. go. Well, you dominated. Nice job. Nice going. And uh, overall, thank you so much for your time. Like, this has been awesome. We could sit and chat all day. And, uh, you know, if we ever get time to go out to Vegas with you, we'd love to join you as well. Let's you know? go. Yeah, great to see you guys. This is awesome. Super fun catching up and and uh, stay in touch. And hopefully we, we run into each other this spring. That'd be awesome. Would love that. JP, by the way, I, he didn't say it, but he said your best move in your entire career was hiring <laughs> him on that staff at ASU. <laughs> hey, Raymac, I, I only have a one bullet point resume. Hired J Perk. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. it <laughs> That's drop. why we did it. That's, That's why he's right. on our That's staff it. now. Mic drop. Let's go. Uh, thanks awesome. so much, Mike. It was great seeing you again and just uh, being able to chat it up. And thanks so much for your time. Yeah, this was awesome, boys. Yeah, thanks for having me. Super fun. Right on. Take care, Coach. We'll talk to you soon. See you, fellas. All right, we're back. Uh, Mike Rooney, amazing. The the analyst, the person, the coach, uh, just an amazing dude. And and a guy, again, like I said, he's my favorite guy to watch and listen to. So the fact that he popped in on our podcast was pretty incredible. Um, and the things that he's doing for the game, you know, volunteer assistants kind of get a bad rap, uh, just not for anything that they do. They're just unpaid. And uh, I think it's the biggest sham in all of college sports, naming someone like that a volunteer, uh, which is crazy. But hey, that's just me making my, my own two cents of it. But he's doing an awesome job putting these guys out um, and taking it all in, right? Like getting their name out there and, and helping push the game forward. So, uh, you know, fingers crossed for me that down the line, eventually it just becomes another paid assistant. And, uh, they can remove that volunteer role. But uh, for now, the things that he's doing for that, and then obviously he dominates the analyst side of things, uh, both with D1 Baseball and ESPN. Um, just incredible interview. So, uh, Mike, we can't thank you enough again for coming out and spending your time with us. I mean, you jumped on super late night um, and, and just killed it. So thank you so much, and uh, we hope to see you again. For us, it's going to do it for me. Uh, this has been Gray McIntyre only. Uh, no BZB, no J Perk, but Major League University once again. Uh, and we look forward to speaking with you guys next time. Uh, we got another couple great guests lined up this week, some pro ball dudes uh, with some amazing stories. So stay tuned for that, and uh, we'll be releasing another episode next week. Hope you guys all have a blessed week, and we will see you soon.